Just make sure that they sign in. I want to welcome everyone to the State House. I'm my State Representative Nick Devin. I'm just to be elected to my third term. Thank you very much. I sit on the Marine Resources Committee for my first uh, two terms, and I certainly hope that I will be placed back there as my new Speaker of the House when make that decision. Um, we will have legislators that will be coming in and out during the day as protocol to recognize them. We'll do that very briefly as that happens. We have uh, Representative David Craig here, she's from Harpswell. She just got reelected to her second term. She sat on the Marine Resources Committee as well last time, and I would assume by the fact that she's present here today that she was very interested in the name of the Marine Resources Committee. Um, our bathrooms out this door, um, if you go off these stairs on the right of the men's room, if you go a little bit further and you take a right um, down that hallway, the first door on the right is the ladies' room. We can provide some administrative needs if they are related to today's symposium. If it's for you personally, unfortunately, you can't ask me off with the teaching uh, business. Just, just come and see me, and I'll direct you to my list of aid who will provide you with those services. And if I'm not available, just ask Jay, um, and we'll get you, we'll get you hooked up. At noon. We are going to have a photo just as we break for lunch. Don't want anyone to leave. We're going to go right out on these stairs and have a group photo. Um, if you have a camera or whatever, we've got staff that can come over and take, take our photo. It's critical that we get all of us together. We want to make a public statement um, that OSHA certification is strongly supported here in Maine. At 3.20, my legislative aide, Mr. Dan Hankley's, We'll be giving a Senate guided tour of the State House that will last 15 to 20 minutes. I have met literally hundreds of scientific meetings. I know they often come late. In fairness to Dan, who has other things going on in his life, that tour will start at 3:20. That schedule starts five minutes after we are scheduled to finish here. All right. Once again, you'll meet, he'll, he'll come down and meet right outside the door, and he'll take you around the State House. Um, I mentioned um, check in. When we get out to leave, if you would please make sure that you take all your belongings with you, keep the chairs arranged as they are now, so that in the future, if we need to have a meeting here again, we will be invited back. Um, I'll have access to the, the space. I mentioned the, uh, the signing table a little bit. And finally, I um, just want to recognize that it's Susie on her birthday today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Strong. I'm an assistant professor of marine policy at the University of Maine. Uh, and on behalf of the other members of the MOCA steering committee, Ivy Frignoka, Susie Arnold, Nick Batista, Esperanza Stanchoff, and Representative Nick Devon, I want to welcome you to our mini symposium on remediation projects uh, and policy directions. Uh, the MOCA partnership is a volunteer partnership that has two purposes. One is to continue to work to implement the recommendations of the 126th legislature sponsored Maine Ocean and Coastal Acidification Commission the other purpose is to coordinate state agency work, researchers, education and outreach programs that seek to address ocean and coastal acidification in our state. And since MOCA was uh, founded at the earlier this year in 2016, uh, we've had three meetings. The first was an initial organizational meeting um, to, to share ideas that took place at the Darling Center back in March. The next was a large symposium attended by over 100 uh, people at the University of Southern Maine, which was intended to provide a, a comprehensive set of updates to what's been going on in the state since the state commission process. So it had been a year and a half at that point. Um, what, what are our new findings? What are our new directions? And there was a report that was released that's on the website from that meeting. And then today is our first mini symposium that's focused on two particular goals of the state from the state commission. One, is uh, to talk about remediation and what the latest science is about remediation projects in the state. And the next is to talk about future policy directions, um, which, is, which is also uh, something that we wanna share and discuss together. 
So our goals for today's mini symposium are to share and learn about updates on the latest remediation research and results, to share and discuss future legislative and potential policy options in the afternoon, and then to have a pretty open discussion, including a, an immediate feedback survey where we'll actually have you, if you have a device, either a computer or a phone, you'll be able to vote and we'll actually see the live results of the, of the vote as we pose some questions to you about future directions of the partnership and in particular, what future areas of focus should be uh, moving forward. So our agenda for today, this morning, we'll focus on nutrients and coastal acidification remediation. We'll have an uh, introductory <laughs> talk from, from Damian Brady uh, to kind of set the stage. And then we'll hear from Aubrey Strauss about stormwater management, from Shane Rogers about bioextraction uh, uh, through kelp, uh, growing kelp, and from Nicole Price about the latest results from phytoremediation work. Then right before lunch, right before you go and get your photo taken, as Mick said, um, we're gonna have an update uh, on NECAN from, from Beth Turner, uh, and, and in particular on the NECAN uh, website. Then uh, lunch is from 12 to one. Uh, the Cross Cafe is in the Cross Building. You can get there by going down, going out and going over there. It's, a, it's an open area and we can meet and have lunch there. I hope some of you brought your bag lunches as well. Um, uh, but be sure to make sure to leave enough time to come back through the metal detector so we can start promptly at one for our afternoon session. So in the morning where we're having these scientific talks, we're going to have questions and answers and discussion after each one of the talks. But in the afternoon, we're going to have a series of three presentations um, and we're going to kind of go back to back and then have a time for a broader open discussion after those three presentations. So uh, Mick is going to lead us off um, talking about uh, the Coastal Caucus January meeting, the R&D bond bill, and a few, uh, future legislative agenda setting. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about water quality criteria for OA in particular. And then Ivy is going to talk a little bit about uh, nutrient criteria and nutrient management. Um, then we're going to have a broad open discussion. And then in the last 45 uh, minutes to 50 minutes or so, we really want to have an open discussion about what MOPIC, as a volunteer partnership, that's continuing to maintain this coordinated state focus on ocean coastal acidification, what we can do uh, moving forward. So Maine's approach is pretty unique. Um, we don't have a state council that's continuing, that's run by the state. We have a volunteer grassroots partnership. And this makes it pretty unique in the country. Maine's one of the few states that's gone through the commission process. Other states are following suit right now. Massachusetts has a bill in its legislature. So I think it's just important to recognize that this meeting here is a key component of one of the few states in the country that's taking action. And in light of recent events, uh, it's all the more important to pay attention to what's coming out of states, and Maine's really leading the way. Um, so with that, I'll hand things uh, over to Susie Arnold to introduce the, the more concession. And I'll pull up Damien's talk. I was told actually, if you turn on this microphone, uh, we can be recorded and then share the recording with the public who wasn't able to attend. So I'm going to leave this microphone on throughout. And um, so first off, we've got Damien Grady. He's an assistant professor at the University of Maine. He's also the assistant director for research at Maine Sea Grant, uh, based at the Darling Center. And he's going to um, link, uh, give us some background on the link between nutrients and coastal acidification. So thank you, Damien. <laughs> okay, so um, I was asked to talk about the link between nutrients and acidification, um, and uh, I can't. I, I tried to ask them to do uh, to ask me to do something a little more boring, but there was nothing else on the agenda. Um, so I'm going to be talking about nutrients, where they go, um, what their uh, biogeochemical impact is on estuaries. Um, I'm going to try to make it as main specific uh, as I can. Um, uh, but uh, Joe Salisbury and Larry Mayer are in the room, so if you have any questions, ask them. <laughs> so if you type in coastal or ocean acidification into Google, there's a kajillion diagrams of it. Okay, so I, uh, um, that's a very scientific technical term. Um, so I just took the very simplest one that I could find. Um, uh, and in this case, it's just a lot of CO2 and you know, it, uh, it comes from, uh, you know, the burning of fossil fuels, at least in this case, or at least this is what I think is a diagram, a diagram of a factory. Um, and so that CO2, uh, when it essentially builds up in the air, gets into the water, 
And um, uh, when it's hydrated, CO2 and H2O, you get um, uh, a weak acid. So this is sort of, I think, the picture that most of us have in our head of what coastal acidification is, or ocean acidification in this case. Um, there's two points that I want to make here. This CO2, I'm going to rename it for the purposes of this talk, and we're going to call it dissolved inorganic carbon. All right, so it's just a, a molecule in the water that's dissolved, um, so it's floating around, it's not particulate, and therefore it sinks. It's inorganic, which it hasn't become life yet, um, and it's carbon. So, and then everything in this water has some total alkalinity. So that's, this is my term introduction. We have this war that goes on in water between dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity. And total alkalinity you can just think of as resistance to um, changes in pH, okay? It's carbonates, bicarbonates, um, things that will absorb protons and therefore make the water buffered against um, pH change. These two things are in direct conflict in many ways, okay? You add more CO2 to the water, you essentially are adding more protons to the water. You add more total alkalinity to the water, you, you resist that change. And what happens is that in the ocean sense, the huge source of DIC, this dissolved inorganic carbon, is from the air. <laughs> the source for DIC as we get closer and closer to shore, can be both the ocean and the air, but it can also be this huge amount of carbon that flows through biological systems like phytoplankton. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm not gonna talk so much about total alkalinity, but obviously it's a really important component of this. But I wanna, I wanna uh, um, talk about this through the lens of these two dynamics happening. Um, a couple of years ago when Friends of Casco Bay put on um, uh, a really great workshop. They invited Scott Doney from Woods Hole to give a talk. I think this was Bad Mud um, a couple of years ago. Um, and he put up this graph just so that people had a sense of why these two systems were so very, very different. If you put a PCO2 measurement or a pH measurement out in the open ocean, it is not changing. Um, the changes that we're going to see over the next couple of hundred years happen every day within an estuary. So we have a problem of signal to noise ratio. pH is moving around a lot, so it's hard to detect the trend when there's so much noise in our data set. And the reason this goes up and down every day is because of photosynthesis and respiration. So we are adding DIC every time we respire, we're adding DIC in the same way that CO2 is going from the atmosphere into the water. And um, vice versa, when we photosynthesize, we're taking DIC out of the water. So that's why we get this kind of dynamic, but it's really, really, makes it really, really difficult to pick up long-term trends. So um, uh, there's a now, I guess, famous, as far as scientists are concerned anyway, this figure uh, published by a guy named Wei Jun Kai, uh, the University of Delaware, I think this is in Nature, it's in 2011, and he tried to summarize coastal acidification, and he used the example of the Gulf of Mexico. There's no place in Maine that is draining, you know, um, at least a third of the country in the way that this dynamic is happening, but it's still instructive. And I blocked this out to try to make it as simple as I could for myself. Um, uh, there are people in this room, I'm sure, that can absorb this whole thing. Um, but for me, I had to sort of step through it. This is the CO2, or in this case, let's think of this, again, as DIC. DIC comes together with some kind of nutrient. Now, a lot of us in this state, when we measure nutrients, we're thinking of total nitrogen. The key part of total nitrogen that's driving phytoplankton production is dissolved inorganic nitrogen. So instead of DIC, we're talking about DIN. I'll try to stop talking in acronyms, but it's, it's almost impossible. This is nitrate. So nutrients, just like you, you know, put fertilizer on your lawn, nitrogen and carbon get together and they make organic matter. So I'm going to try to follow this organic matter and sort of demonstrate what happens to it over time. So CO2 and nutrients come together, they create organic matter. So nutrients, the role of nutrients in acidification, we're going to follow that organic matter. That organic matter is produced here, it produces, uh, it takes DIC out of the water, this process right here, it produces oxygen, we've got high pH, low PCO2, we've got no problems. So nutrients in this case, are actually, in some ways, fueling higher pH, all right? That's a really important point. 
That organic matter, of course, now went from dissolved, so it's just in the water, to particulate, which means it can sink. And that's a really big deal. On the ocean end member, I've got this ocean water that's full of this anthropogenic CO2, right? Because it's a huge ocean that's absorbing all the CO2 from the air. And so it's full of DIC, or becoming more full every day, let's put it that way. And it is doing what we think about acidification. I know it's another chemical equation, but just think of DIC in water. So this is that first equation that I showed just before. So it's bringing in protons. This is a place where protons are being sucked out of the water by photosynthesis. It's bringing that in, and now we're mixing. We're exporting organic matter into it, and we're mixing these two water bodies. Finally, my organic matter, that's my nutrient, this is what, the reason I was called in here today, so I know this is horrible to look at, <laughs> uh, but it's why I'm here, um, to help us in any way I can. So organic matter in us now sunk out of the surface layer, and now it is down in this deeper layer, and organic matter, eventually, something has to happen to it. And if it's in the water column, it's gonna consume oxygen and sort of go the other way, right? This equation right here is the exact opposite of this one. So it's organic matter plus oxygen goes the other way to more DIC and more nutrient. And it gets recycled down here in the sediment. So my ultimate point here is that nutrients by themselves are not causing acidification. It's not more nutrient means more acidification. What happens is when these processes become uncoupled, this process of organic matter decomposition and organic matter production, when they are separated in space and time, that's when we create essentially more protons than we would have normally. So how do we typically decouple or make respiration and photosynthesis two separate and have them happen in two separate areas? Almost always in estuaries, this happens via stratification. I have some surface mix layer, I create um, organic matter, that's that green, yellow stuff right here. It comes down here and then it gets consumed, which puts DIC into the water. So the DIC is getting uh, taken up in this, in this part of the estuary and it's getting released in this part of the estuary. This is the problem. So if you have a well-mixed estuary, for instance, and this doesn't happen, then you don't overall have a heterotrophic or a, an area where you start <laughs> generating lots and lots of protons. So that happens typically in, in, uh, in space via stratification. So it's a really important thing to, to take into account. The other way that people are increasingly see it is in time. We can decouple these in time. Um, we have this thing called nighttime, and that shuts off photosynthesis, and all we're doing is pumping DIC into the water, right, as that stuff respires. So this is a dissolved oxygen profile, but it goes down. You have net respiration and net production during the day. These are two ways that we're seeing in estuaries the um, influence of nutrients on acidification is when we decouple these either in space or in time. So I wanna bring up some main examples. Where in Maine can we, are, maybe are we seeing this kind of problem pop up? Um, this is from the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance and COA. Um, this is a group of now, I think 12 NGOs from Friends of Casco Bay all the way to Rockport Conservation District. This is the Sheepscot Estuary. This is the ocean, the, this is the sort of the estuarine section, and then this is the river right up here. And I just want to notice that for the most part in NMCOA's uh, um, surveying, and um, citizen science, fantastic sentinel organizational um, philosophy, right? You have them go out and they start to see things, and hopefully you entrain scientists to try to tell, tell them why what they're seeing has happened. In this case, this is a huge, very, very low pH water in this sort of pinkish, purplish hue right here, and it's just sitting offshore. And in most of the estuaries that are sampled, where we see the issue is offshore, just offshore of the estuary, not way out in the Gulf of Maine, but just offshore of the estuary. Um, this is just a plot that I really, really like uh, now. Um, we have buoys along the coast of Maine. And what, I, what I'm showing you here is this is Damerscotta, the Damerscotta estuary. This is the upper Damerscotta, what we call Lobo Wen. It's by Bill Mook's Sea Farm. This is the temperature record over time at Bill Mook's Sea Farm. This is almost 100 miles away in Saco. We have this great teleconnector that is connecting all these estuaries. It's called the Gulf of Maine. And a lot of what happens 
um, within the Gulf of Maine, whatever's happening in the Gulf of Maine is affecting these estuaries. So this spike in temperature is reflected in a spike in temperature in Saco. This spike is reflected in Saco. So even though these places are 100 miles away, there's this great connecting influence of the Gulf of Maine that's influencing all these estuaries on some scale. Now, the upper Damariscotta, even though it's, it's 50 miles north of Saco, has way higher temperatures um, because of a geomorphological feature that sort of keeps the residence time higher in one estuary than the other. So yes, all estuaries are still snowflakes. They're all totally and completely unique, but they're all under the influence of the Gulf of Maine. So my colleague, Dave Townsend, um, up on, uh, in Orono, um, has really started um, uh, starting to dive into why we're seeing this offshore mass of low pH water. Um, and our current, one of his current hypotheses that we're going to um, try to explore uh, soon is, what if we're getting stratification from the eastern main coastal current? So this is the coast of Maine. The eastern main is very well mixed. Water is very well mixed, the surface to the bottom. Western Maine is very stratified, or relatively more stratified. So this cold water, as it crosses the Penobscot, can subduct and go under the Western Maine coastal current. So one hypothesis that we're at least you know, starting to explore now is maybe this is the type of stratification that sets up the consumption of organic matter and therefore maybe creates low pH water. And I bring this up totally as a hypothesis. Um, we're still working on a lot of this data, but. Um, so maybe this is the reason that places just offshore um, are in that position. So how do we actually start to explore this and get a sense um, uh, of what, get a better handle on the role of nutrients in acidification? This is Wells. Um, uh, that is missing here, but this is a one if by land. So um, the land processes are introducing nutrients, both non-point sources, point sources, um, but also introducing lower total alkalinity. So it's, it's playing a role in that way too. Two of by sea. Um, and so if that offshore Gulf of Maine water has particular chemistry that's making it essentially more acidic within the estuaries, it'd be good to know about that. And then I don't know if Paul Revere knew about this, but the sediments are playing a really, really big role too. And I'm not going to get into the, the dynamics here, um, uh, um, but I'm just going to sort of highlight a couple of these, um, uh, of these sources and what we know and what we don't know. Joe Salisbury's in the room. He made this excellent map that shows that here's the Kennebec River plume. Um, this is low aragonite saturation. So that's this um, omega right here. That low aragonite saturation that's blue make, means it's harder for shellfish to grow shell. And that's partially at least the responsibility of freshwater being low in total alkalinity. It makes our estuaries more susceptible to acidification over time. It also, of course, is chock full of nutrients on some level too. Um, this is one of my you know, big take homes. Uh, so I wrote it in big letters here. <laughs> but that, we can start looking at total alkalinity, that's great. But river flow times the nutrient concentration in that river flow equals nutrient loading. And we don't have that in the state, really. We don't gauge our rivers. We don't have, have a great sense of what the non-point sources are. We do know, though, that the Gulf of Maine is a humongous source of nitrogen into most of our estuaries that don't have a you know, strong anthropogenic signal. For instance, here's the Damariscotta River. The same is, is true of the Saco. Um, throughout the summer, we have very low nitrate. Then we get overturned, nor'easters, stuff that happens in the Gulf of Maine. And most of this nitrate is coming from the ocean into our estuary. So getting a sense of what that ocean end member looks like, too, is really important. That's my two if I see right there. Um, sediments are really, really tricky and a whole other animal. There's lots of stuff that says most of the parameters and processes we investigated show no relationship with overlying seawater pH. It's really hard for the dynamics I'm talking about that happen in the water column to influence the sediment. Um, uh, because most of the processes that happen in the sediment are happening way faster on way bigger scales than what's happening in the water column. And so they require uh, individual attention, um, what happens in the sediment. <clears throat> but we know that in shallow estuaries, they're strongly connected, the sediment and the water, and that's mostly because the sediment is exerting an influence on the water column. All that organic matter, that OM that I talked about in the beginning, ends up in the sediment, it has to consume oxygen, so even though it's anaerobic. So we have sediment oxygen demand, we have sulfate reduction that can influence, is actually a source of total alkalinity to estuaries. 
So <clears throat> if I've done anything, uh, I probably um, have demonstrated it is really complex and even my understanding is low probably, but um, we need to start doing a better tra uh, a job of tracking nutrients, so both non-point oceanic um, influences and point. Um, be nice to get a better sense of total alkalinity and its role in the estuaries and start thinking of uh, this carbon stuff as dissolved inorganic carbon. We've done a really good job in this country over a number of years modeling dissolved inorganic nitrogen for the purposes of alleviating something called hypoxia or low oxygen. We have to start thinking the same way about carbon. <coughs> um, we measure total nitrogen in Maine. That means that some of it's particulate, some of it's dissolved, and a lot of that dissolved can be dissolved organic nitrogen. Um, I don't want to go overly jargony, but we have to figure out how much of this total nitrogen we're measuring is bioreactive or bioavailable and causing this kind of respiration. Um, and you know, this is my own uh, uh, call here. This stuff is complex, and if we really want to assign um, blame, or blame is a horrible term, but if we really want to say, hey, this is where this is coming from, we need a model because there's so many things happening in this box that we call an estuary that it'd be nice to sort of try to calculate what the relative influence of these sources might be in the future. That's it. So minutes for questions for Damien. Yeah, um, originally, we were kind of set up and <clears throat> wondering about ocean acidification and its relationship to, to the commercial seafood industry. Yeah. Which, <laughs> I, I'm wondering this nutrient thing, how we still have trouble, I still have trouble answering questions. And these, what 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 is the problem that's only ocean acidification, and how do, how do these algal blooms that, that also affect me and hypoxia business, which we we just went through that that are part of all of that. How do they all come to me? <laughs> is there a way to explain how they all come together and and how um, the significant relationship? My uh, feeling on that is, is maybe to start by thinking about the physics. You know, if I rewind and really go back to the beginning, um, when and where do we get times where um, uh, DIC is going into the water without being consumed by phytoplankton? So that is, where is the stuff decomposing? And where it's decomposing, then yes, we are generating more DIC and more protons. So I like to think of the the physics being really important. So where on the, along the coast of Maine is water essentially away from the light, for instance? Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Where is it at the end of a season and you have a macroalgal bed that's decomposing a lot? So where is it that we're decomposing but not productive? Um, then, that, then the production of organic matter is really, really important. Um, uh, and I would say now that I think about it a lot more, um, the Gulf of Maine is also probably a nutrient story, um, uh, as much as it's also, uh, you know, this um, ocean acidification piece, right, that is making our water a little bit more acidic at a boundary, you know, that keeps coming into the Gulf of Maine. But the dynamics, the production of organic matter inside the Gulf of Maine that makes it really productive and, and helps us have, you know, fantastic fisheries, wherever that material is not getting, um, not, not touching the light, essentially, is a place where you can generate um, uh, low pH. And no, that doesn't answer your question. <laughs> um, uh, because it's tricky, but it's also when and where. As we get closer to shore, we've got land influences that are creating organic matter. And I think as we get away from shore, we've got sort of the classic um, uh, introduction of nutrients through the Northeast Channel. Sort of. um, so it just depends on where and where, which is not a satisfying answer, I know. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Damien. Hey. Um, um, it's a really good question. Um, uh, I don't know if you were going to talk about the vulnerability assessments or um, a little bit later. Okay. 
Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll briefly say that NOAA has a vulnerability assessment FFO out on the street right now. It is specifically, it says very clearly in the language, no new data. Because <laughs> for a lot of people, there's a ton of data out there that hasn't been connected. Um, so we have applied for that. Um, there's a strong sense that they want something from Maine or from the Northeast part of the country. So I don't know, we'll see. Um, uh, that's more um, Gulf of Maine wide. Let's just try to get every piece of data together and start getting a sense of at least what our conceptual model looks like um, and where the, where the real data gaps are for, for nutrients. And then to further answer your question, um, you know, where I would specifically want to target you know, in the future would be a place where all these dynamics take place in a really, really small confined area. So both point sources, non-point sources, offshore, um, uh, offshore influences. So places in Southern Maine make a lot of sense. Places certainly in Western Maine make a lot of sense because if it is uh, under the influence of this Eastern Maine coastal current getting subducted under Western Maine, I would start there and then cut it down to an estuary with a lot of those dynamics. Yeah, Joe. Can you go back to that time series and the Damascus and the uh, Yes, I can. And so I assume this is uh, assume nitrate data. Uh, I don't think I showed nitrate data. Just temperature, just to, just to get a sense of. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these are these are nitrate samples. Oh, oh, it's discrete sample? Yes. And these are in, um, where in here? This is in the Damariscotta, and this is silicate down here. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so this goes way down in the, um, way down in the mark, so it's got this season that's way down. It's an interesting, you know, one thing that makes this plot interesting is um, uh, that we're sustaining 90% of the oysters in Maine on, you know, less than two micromolar. <laughs> <laughs> nitrate. Um, so uh, anything that's around is getting used uh, for sure. I'd like to see that colored by salinity. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Did I have one more question? One small question. Um, yeah. Back to the temperature graph, the uh, interaction between the two. Streams. Um, how's weather taken out of there? Um, how's weather taken out of these two temperature signals? Yeah. Uh, it's not. So that's under the influence. So the whole Gulf of Maine is obviously warming. Um, what's happening in those two areas, in terms of why they're parallel, is that there's more heating going on here than here. But a lot of the over the course of two or three weeks, a lot of the patterns sort of match. So both all these estuaries are under the influence of tidal flushing, right? Because we have nine, 10 foot tidal ranges. So what happens in the Gulf of Maine doesn't stay in the Gulf of Maine. <laughs> Chris had a question here. Well, just to what extent does the near shore microalgae deposition in my flat somewhere not just having a separation factor? So near shore, like micro phyto, like like benthic diatom mats and yeah, stuff like that. Under the influence of storm water bringing nutrient loading yeah. and blooming. Yeah. And then settling somewhere and, and having insufficient nutrients to support continued phytoplankton growth. Um, so that you're basically describing a bloom, right? I get a huge storm, I get a pulse of nutrients, your phytoplankton bloom and bloom and bloom, and then something has to happen to it, right? Um, it has to go the other way. <laughs> We're under a growing trend of significant storm trend. Right. So, and, and it, I don't, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but this is where I think models become helpful because extreme events are doing two things. One, they're increasing your flushing time, right? Um, uh, and then two, they're increasing your nutrient load. And so it's a balance between the residence time, how long the stays, stuff stays in the system, versus um, how much stuff came in to start with. And so, you know, if I start with just a box model, um, you know, those two things are bouncing. Huh? That's right, so your flow model hopefully tells you where it ends up settling. And then this is why NOAA wants these things like vulnerability assessments, like 
if I was looking for a certification, where should I look? And then when I go there and I say, this is where the problem is, then I can sort of connect it and say, oh, well, this is where my clams live, or this is where my lobsters settle, um, or, or this is where my scallop bed is. You know? So which species are susceptible is some function of where this organic matter ends up getting processed. <laughs> I think you said that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you, David. So up next we have Aubrey Shaw from Strauss, and Aubrey is the stormwater program manager and district engineer at the Cumberland County Soil and Water District. Um, she's also the owner and manager of Vernon Water, and she was the 2014 president of the Maine Water Environment Association. So thank you, Aubrey. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to say two things. It is super rare that when I get up and do a presentation, I am not the one using the most acronyms. So this is so delightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to say that I really, really appreciated um, Ivy reaching out to, to, um, to Damien and have him kind of set the stage. So I'm going to build a little bit on top of what he did. And also, every time I hear you speak, I feel like three times smarter. So it's a personal benefit, too. So, um, yeah. yeah. He's not going to fit out of the room. His head's going to be like this big. So oh, you're staying. I guess you're not going out for lunch. So uh, I am the I am the uh, stormwater program manager for Cumberland County Stormwater Conservation District. As such, I also manage the technical work of the Long Creek project, which is a, a really unique project in uh, Portland, South Portland, Scarborough, and Westbrook. It's 140 plus private properties. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, toward the end of my, my session this morning, because something I would like to do is build on what Damien started. I'm going to talk a little bit about the loads that come from land, what we know, what we don't know, um, the programs in the state that are looking at those. What are some of the permit programs that are looking to, to tell us more about stormwater and what those nutrient loads are? But when Ivy first uh, approached me to speak at this, I didn't make the connection. Um, I, and I'm making it. I make the connection a little bit better every time I, I hear Damien talk about modeling and what the models show us. But stormwater remediation, to me, did not automatically connect to ocean acidification. And that's because I think in Maine, the perspective is a little bit different than some, in some places. So if you Google ocean acidification, you're going to find tons of information. But here in Maine, the conversation about ocean acidification is much more focused. Okay? We are focusing a lot of that conversation on coastal acidification. And that is exactly what Richard was saying. We're talking more about coastal acidification because it has a direct potential bearing on a huge portion of Maine's economy. So ocean acidification, big issue, lots of research, very consistent information around the, around the globe, really, on ocean acidification. But coastal acidification, now we're changing that conversation. We're asking some questions that aren't asked everywhere else. Something else is that when you do Google ocean acidification, what you'll find consistent, consistently is that carbon dioxide, you know, the, the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere, our oceans being a sponge, absorbing that, that is well understood to be a major cause of this in deforestation, which, which reduces the, the natural buffers associated with that. Here in Maine, much more of the conversation is about nutrients role. In this than anywhere else. And again, I would encourage you to, to do some research. You don't hear as much conversation about nutrients um, everywhere else in the world with how they impact acidification or don't than we do here in Maine. So we're learning a lot about that. And I think what Damien said it too is that we're still learning that. We're really only starting that, uh, that conversation to understand the impact of nutrients. But I will, again, like I said, talk about some of the loadings that come from stormwater and how we currently are treating those now. And the third thing is that um, I was fortunate enough to come to the symposium that this group held in June at USM, and I learned an incredible amount there. I learned about a huge amount of the work that's being done by a lot of people who are in this room on this topic, specific to Maine water, specific to loadings in Maine. And if you didn't get a chance to go to that, I would encourage you to look up those presentations because they were really fantastic, really huge uh, wealth of resources we have here. So I had to mentally set the stage for myself to, to think about, if I'm going to talk about stormwater and the treatment that we can do for stormwater, what approach am I going to take? So I'm going to talk about a couple of the programs first. Um, stormwater is a huge topic. 
Um, this is millions and millions of dollars worth of research and monitoring and public education here in Maine alone, and multiply that times 50, so you'll see what a big issue it is around the country. Um, but I'm going to start out with some super basic stuff, very, very basic things. What is stormwater? Well, stormwater is what hits impervious surfaces. Impervious surface is a term that you hear every single day in my business. What we like to do is minimize impervious surface. Okay? We don't want to build it in the first place, but once it's built, what are some of the ways we can capture what's hitting it, treat it, get it back into the groundwater ideally? So in this particular picture, you know, rooftops are impervious. Roadways are impervious. Um, gravel, gravel walks, um, you know, compacted natural surfaces can be impervious because rain can no longer soak into those. What's in stormwater? Well, it can contain a lot of different things, and this picture shows you a few of them. One of the ones that I focus a lot on with my work in Long Creek and also with municipalities in Cumberland County is sediment, dirt. You know, in this case, we have a construction site, and we have sediment, sand, dirt being trapped onto a roadway, an impervious surface, from that construction site. So the next time it rains, if we haven't had that swept and cleaned up, that is entering the catch basins, there's a catch basin over there, there's another one right downstream, and that's getting into whatever receiving water is, is right there. Nobody thinks of construction as a sexy stormwater thing, but it really is. It's a huge potential source of pollution. Uh, chemicals, you have both fertilizer and pesticide, but you also have whatever we use in our lives. California was one of the first states to realize that brake dust, you know, brake pads in your car had a huge number of heavy metals in them. And every time you brake, little tiny particulate heavy metals are coming off of your tires, your brake pads, they're landing on the roadway surface, and then when it rains, flushed into a water body. So states all around the country are looking at this sort of from a new perspective. What are we using? You know, what we use, what our equipment uses, what emissions we have gets onto roadway surfaces, gets into water bodies. Down here you see a picture of a snow pile. Um, so you think, okay, that's, that's great, that's fine. Although Susie, I think you wrote an article, what, two years ago or so, about when you were walking your dog and you came across like a snow dump pile and you were like, that is so disgusting. It's got bags of dog shit in it, right? It's got salt, it's got trash, it's got all gravel, it's got sand, it's got everything that was on the road when it was plowed, right? So snow, and when we put the snow into piles and it melts, that's a source, a very concentrated source of lots of stuff that's gonna melt and run into the nearest catch basin here. So we pay a lot of attention to snow piles. Um, our own municipal salt use. Um, Maine has been a leader in reducing the pounds of chloride per lane mile that we apply to roadways. You don't want to put more salt down just because you can, just for safety. You have to be very judicious about what you put down and why. And fertilizers and pesticides. I'm going to, I'm going to do the, the, the dog last because that one's the cutest, but also like the grossest. So, um, <laughs> you know, fertilizer and pesticide. A lot of the clients, towns I've worked with say, well, we, we use organic fertilizer. Doesn't matter. Organic fertilizer as is just as effective and powerful a source of nutrients to a water body as regular fertilizer. Okay, so just because it's organic and natural doesn't do you any good. Step one is always to figure out, do I even need to put fertilizer down? Is my yard, is my field, is my garden going to benefit from nitrogen or phosphorus? What's it limiting? So at the Soil and Water Conservation District, we have a very strong connection to agriculture. That's always our first step. So the dog, what's the connection with the dog? Pet waste. Pet waste is like the biggest source of bacteria and nitrogen in stormwater, and it's also the absolute easiest to solve. It is almost totally pre preventable. The city of Portland, however, when they clean out catch basins, which are not just trash cans buried in the street, believe it or not, uh, when they clean out their catch basins, they will get like two dozen bags of dog waste. People have taken the time to pick up the dog waste put it in the bag, tie it, and then they fling it into a catch basin, okay? So if there's nothing else to learn from me, that those are not trash cans that are buried in the streets, okay? Seriously. These all get into stormwater. To what degree we are gathering information, and in fact, we're gathering that information from the Long Creek Project as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. Where does stormwater go? This may seem obvious to you guys, but it's not always obvious to the public, okay? We have a sewer pipe that contains wastewater, okay? This is true in most communities. I'm gonna give you some examples, some examples of differences in a little bit. 
There's one pipe that contains wastewater, and that goes to a wastewater plant. Okay, it could be the you know, biggest plant in the state or a tiny little plant. Maybe you don't even know where your local plant is, and that's good. It's doing a good job if you don't know where it is. Second set of pipes that contains just stormwater. Now, this is true for most main communities. That second pipe that contains stormwater, that doesn't go to a treatment plant. That goes to a, maybe a ditch alongside the road, and then that ditch goes to a bigger ditch, and then that ditch is going into a water body. Or sometimes, it isn't even a ditch. Sometimes that pipe is just going directly into a stream, but it's not going to a treatment plant. This is one of the reasons you'll see Friends of Casco Bay doing such a fantastic job too of stenciling at its catch basins, reminding people this goes directly to Casco Bay. We do that with lots of our communities that we work with in Cumberland County and around the country, more and more communities are stenciling that. We even have a Long Creek stencil now that the main mall is using that a lot of our landowners are using there. So this might seem obvious to everybody in this room because you've heard these conversations before, but it's not obvious to a lot of the general public. Stormwater doesn't get treatment. So when we are talking about the work that the towns, for example, of Maine are doing, it is almost always preventing pollution. It's almost always preventing those materials from getting onto impervious surfaces in the first place. It's much, much, much cheaper and more effective to prevent those loadings from happening than to treat them once it's in the stormwater. Okay. In a few communities in Maine, we have combined sewer systems where this stuff is in the same pipe. Okay. But during, during normal events, when there's not a big rain event happening, everything, including the stormwater, is going to the wastewater plant. And in fact, up until a pretty darn big storm, everything is still going to the wastewater plant. When there's a gigantic storm and the wastewater plant can't take it, Many communities like Portland are investing in giant conduits. Uh, for example, Baxter Boulevard, if you have done the walk around the back home in Portland, Baxter Boulevard has gigantic conduits that store that combined wastewater so it can go to the plant once the storm is over. So that's a little bit of an exception. All right, urban stormwater. I talked about a little bit about impervious surface. So in the natural state, before we started to develop everything, we had a great water cycle. It would rain, rain would soak in, you've got groundwater, you can use that for drinking, some water runs off into streams, that's habitat. But as we started developing and putting a lot more impervious surface down, what did we do? We cut off that recharge back to groundwater and we sent a whole lot more uh, runoff directly into these water bodies. Again, it's not treated. So this is what we kind of have now. We've created these problems by having increased development and not trying to minimize the impervious surface we're creating. We're fixing that now. We're fixing that now uh, when we do new development or when we redevelop existing parcels. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. All right, so I'm gonna first talk about what we call chapter 500. Chapter 500's official title is the Stormwater Management Law and Site Location of Development Law. Chapter 500 applies statewide. And it applies when you have a new development or a redevelopment that's an acre or more, okay? So it used to be, a couple years ago, you'd get away with doing a development in phases and you do this little piece and then this little piece and then this little piece and this little piece, and you might have like two acres total um, and it didn't hit the trigger. Now it hits the trigger. You can't, you can't do that anymore. So you can't just get away with it by doing lots of little tiny projects. And what this means is that if you're, if your development or your redevelopment, let's say you have a big, uh, let's just say it's a, like a big strip mall and it wants to get redeveloped and it's more than an acre, you now have to treat the water that's hitting that surface. You have to treat at least 95% of the impervious area. So that's the parking lot itself or the roofs or the you know, sidewalks, that kind of thing. And you have to treat 80% of the developed area. So that could be even like little islands that are in there, it could be grass areas. So you add that all up and it tells you how much of that site you have to treat. And you can use a number of different treatment devices to provide that treatment. There's, and I'll show you a couple of them, but there's, there's wet basins, there's rain gardens, there's subsurface infiltration systems. I'll show you pictures of what those look like under construction and when they're done. Um, but you have to provide treatment, and in each one, you have to capture a certain amount of water. Sometimes you have to capture the first inch that hits the pavement. Sometimes it's a little bit more than that, sometimes a little bit less than that. So you're capturing the water that hits impervious, you're putting it into a treatment system, 
and you're trying to keep as much of it on site and recharging it back into your groundwater as possible. You don't want it anymore, just take runoff, put it in a pipe, the pipe dumps into a stream. We are getting away from that as a, an industry. Yeah? And I'm kind of surprised by your saying one because of the standard that you've evolved to engineering yep. for multiple day, multiple yep. inch events. Yes. We'll talk about that. I'll talk. Okay. So I'm going to cover that next. You were, did you see this before I go? <laughs> so, so you're right. Storms are getting bigger and more frequent, right? So a one-inch storm that happens all the time. <laughs> um, but even just a few weeks ago in the South Portland area, we had a storm that delivered 4.05 inches in a, like a 24 hour, no, like a 36-hour period. You're not in your head because you, you saw it too, right? But um, so what happens there? You're still treating. You're still treating the flow. You're still treating the one inch or whatever, a little bit more than one inch. And it is based on the storm size, but you're also storing on site. You can provide storage on site in retention, uh, big retention basins. They don't provide treatment, but they will hold back flow so that when the storm is over, kind of like those conduits do, it can infiltrate into the ground or it can go into streams. So we are in the stormwater world addressing the fact that we're having big storms more often and the storms are bigger. We do have to look at that. Chapter 500, Appendix H, is what defines the storm size that you have to capture in a certain frequency for that storm size. So we will, then I'll show you some of the, the treatment systems. This is what they look like. So they can do a couple different things. They can do pre-treatment, they can treat and discharge into a pipe or into a stream, or they can treat and infiltrate. This is called a hydrodynamic separator. This is stuck inside a catch basin, what it does is it picks up the big stuff. It picks up the grit, the gravel, the sand, the trash, the bags of dog poop, and it keeps them inside that basin so that what flows out is clean. It doesn't have that stuff in it. <laughs> what do you think is one of our issues, or not issues, but things that we have to plan for with this? We have to make sure that we are constantly removing that grit and debris and trash and sand and oil and stuff that's in there, or else it will build up. Uh, here we have what's called a gravel wetland. Now this doesn't even look like a treatment system, it just looks like a pond. But what happens is we have water coming in, running from our impervious surfaces. We have a lot of chemical processes happening under here that are, this is designed for nutrients actually. This is uh, designed to remove nitrogen. So we have native soils doing the work. We have native vegetation doing the work to remove that nitrogen so that what leaves the system down here is much, much cleaner than what came in. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like in real life. And this, you may have seen in your own towns. This is a subsurface system called Contact. And what happens is water will flow in there during your big storms, just like you were talking about, and they fill up. These big subsurface tanks fill up with water during the storm, and then as the storm is over, they are discharging them to groundwater. They have a high level overflow on them so that when you get like a hundred year storm, it's still going into the stream, but you're capturing a huge amount of flow uh, volume, and that volume is what's defined in chapter 500. And here's what some of those look like. These are all in Long Creek, I mentioned around the main mall. You probably have driven by them and not even known they're there. So we have a number of vegetated medians. Some of them have trees, some of them have um, shrubs, some of them have wildflowers, most of them are native species. Uh, and you can see that what happens is water hits the vegetation, when the water's too high, it goes over into a subsurface system. And when that, when it's up too big of a storm, even for that to happen, it goes into South Portland's municipal system. But we've captured a huge amount of flow, treated it, and infiltrated it. Uh, under drain soil filters are kind of like rain gardens. You've heard about rain gardens. They're pretty, they're attractive, they provide treatment. You have to uh, remove the material every now and then. Storm treat units are also very similar. These are near Dick's Sporting Goods in South Portland, if you know that area. We have um, water going subsurface, getting treated for nutrients and other materials. This is our gravel wetland. This is at the corner of the main mall near Macaroni Grill. Uh, it's one of the biggest in New England that we have at the main mall. Um, and it provides treatment of nutrients and it's actually a huge habitat area too. We just had blue herons out there yesterday. So it's really lovely to go out. And some of our structures you wouldn't even know are there. This looks like just a little tiny manhole in the road, but underneath you'll see um, six different high rate treatment filters that are treating nutrients, both phosphorus and nitrogen being removed in that. You wouldn't even know it's there. 
So you may be seeing stormwater treatment systems every day, everywhere you go, and not know they're there. All right, moving on. Clean Water Act permit. In Maine, the stormwater permit that applies to municipalities is called the MS4. It stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems. So that's why we say MS4. It's just easier. And these are the MS4 communities in Maine. Some of them are in the room with us today. So these towns have to do a certain number of things. There's six minimum control measures, MCMs, that these towns have to do. The first two are public education and outreach. One of the biggest challenges we have is getting the public to understand what stormwater is and getting them to realize that what goes into a catch basin is not going to a treatment plant. So these first two, we spend an awful lot of time and money working on these but they're also incredibly valuable because that's where your, where your um, pollution prevention really comes from. If you can educate municipalities and the towns and the residents about not over applying fertilizer, about picking up pet waste, that's where you're gonna get a huge bang for the buck. The third one, illicit discharge detection elimination. Obvious examples of this are when you have a sanitary sewer cross connected into a storm drain. Okay, we don't want that. We don't want a house with sanitary sewer going into a storm drain. Less obvious illicit discharges can be someone who's constantly dumping yard waste into a stream. Okay, that's not composting. That's just dumping. It's illegal dumping, and you're going to reduce the dissolved oxygen in that stream. You're also adding whatever fertilizer was on that grass to begin with. So we work with these towns to help them um, identify illicit discharges and get their residents to, to sort of remediate those and to improve those. And then the other three, and I talked about these a little bit before, construction. There's a huge amount of work we can do with construction. I talked about tracking before, where if it rains, this is going to go into catch basins. But the other things that we have to do is we have to ensure that appropriate sedimentation and erosion control is up at construction sites. So if, you're in, if you live in one of those MS4 communities, your town is required to have a very tight control over construction projects and know exactly what that contractor is going to build what they're going to do first, how much soil they're going to have disturbed at one time. They want to minimize how much soil is open at one time. Um, and also make sure that there's good um, silt fences up. I'm, at, I'm out of time, right? Yeah, I talk a lot. I, I don't know why. I'm sorry, I always do. But this, I think this is my last slide. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is good housekeeping and, oh, now I skipped one. Post-construction, this is once you have some stormwater treatment systems installed, how do you maintain them? Whose job is it to maintain them? Who does the inspection on them? How often do they have to be inspected? Who's gonna do the inspection? And then good housekeeping and pollution prevention, that's where the municipalities themselves have to maintain clean facilities. Public works garages, for example, can't have giant piles of salt outside because as we've seen, that can dissolve in the rain. So we need to have that put away. We don't wanna minimize spills. And if we have a spill, we wanna clean it up and get those spill materials off site. What are the challenges? This is my last slide, I lied earlier, but it really is. Challenges, capital cost. If you're not a chapter 500 town, what teeth, what teeth does your community have to require stormwater treatment to be installed? Some towns do have excellent stormwater, uh, municipal stormwater ordinances, even if they don't have to, but not all of them do. Um, and is it just applied just to new development or even redevelopment? Secondly, a maintenance cost. In Long Creek, we are only starting to gather what it costs us to maintain all of these. We have 180 different best management practices, 180 different treatment systems. We are only gathering information now on that. And that information is gonna help inform us whether we wanna install more of that thing, or maybe not. We have one device that costs $10,000 to put in and $5,000 a year to maintain. That is not a good investment. We're probably not gonna use that one again. But even when it comes to maintenance, who's going to do it? Who's responsible for that? With Long Creek, we have a, a well-funded project set up to track that. But in the communities of Maine, it is up to your municipal staff to know, to know which systems are our job, the towns, which ones are being managed by homeowners associations, which ones are being maintained by the private property owner themselves and keep track of those. Because the most important thing when it comes to stormwater systems is that it's great to stick it in the ground, but if you don't do the maintenance on it that's needed, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna keep removing nutrients. It's not gonna keep removing trash. It's just gonna fail. So now you have an expensive mammal, pretty much is what you have. So what are the responsibilities of the town versus those homeowner associations? 
And how effective are each one? And I mentioned that with Long Creek specifically, we are still gathering that information. And we're the biggest and first in the country that's really doing that. So the information that's coming from the Long Creek Project will inform lots of other groups and organizations that are looking to do something similar. So that was it for me. And I probably used up part of my question time, but I'm sorry about that. Or all of my question time. Okay. It's a primer, at least. Um, we have time for one or two questions. And why don't we load the next presentation while we take those questions? Anything at all? Yeah. Well, in Long Creek, um, we have 15 um, continuous monitor stations. We also monitor snowmelt runoff. Uh, that program is like, I'm going to say it's like $60,000 a year for the monitoring, so it's pretty expensive. In the MS4 communities, that's something we're going to see more of in the upcoming permit, the next MS4 municipal permit comes out in 2018. That's relying much more on field kits. I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to mention that. Field kits to look at surfactants, which are detergent, okay, um, uh, nitrogen, uh, ammonia nitrogen. We're looking at chloride. We don't expect to see these in stormwater. If we see these things in stormwater at high concentrations, then we have some kind of source coming in that we really want to go mitigate. So in Long Creek, we have a very formal system with a number of meters that are doing continuous monitoring data. But in most municipalities, it's right now, it's, it's mostly field kits they're using just to kind of compare different outfalls and runoff from different areas. I have uh, kind of a two-part question. The first part question is relating back to Damien's answer to me before. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a difference if, if you're being closed or underground away from the light or exposed to light, uh, above ground meaning some kind of channels. And the second question is, is there a danger of, of bypassing some kind of natural uh, step in this and driving a certain amount of chemicals or nutrients into our groundwater system? That's a good point. Quicker, yeah. That's a good point. So even the infiltration based, I'm going to do the second part first, the infiltration based treatment systems, they're still capturing the big stuff, the grit, the oil, the heavy metals before that gets to groundwater. But you're right. That is something that we are, uh, academics are starting to look at. If we have these subsurface treatment systems that are infiltrating the groundwater, how do we make sure that that continues to be safe, right? Um, the first part is, um, a, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's subsurface or not. They do different things. Uh, the subsurface systems do kind of one kind of treatment, and the above ground systems mimic natural systems like wetlands. So we want the light because the light helps the vegetation grow, the vegetation removes the nutrients, and then we remove the vegetation, get it out of there so it's not a source. All right. Thank, Thank you, Aubrey. Thank you for inviting me here. This is a really nice opportunity to share some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, we've been doing some of that work here in Booth Bay Harbor in Maine. And so hopefully you'll see some of the stuff that we've been doing here and maybe learn a little bit about how that might work. And uh, maybe I can provide a vision for something different than what you might normally see in wastewater treatment. Uh, so just as a prefix to this, uh, one of my primary interests in this, I, I, I'm at, at, at core, a water quality engineer, uh, and also very interested in agriculture. A lot of my work has been around agriculture. And uh, in this context, what brings this project close to me and, and uh, the things that I value is the aquaculture opportunities that come from that. Uh, so uh, adding value to systems that don't necessarily have value to begin with. And so first and foremost, uh, what I'm interested in is providing opportunities for people to have aquaculture, to have uh, different types of revenue streams, and finding ways that we might be able to interface those with other types of activities to be the most productive 
across all those different sectors uh, so that we might get the most gains from all of those. So that's really the driver behind what we're doing. The time that I spent in Norway was really to learn uh, quite a bit. I'm a, being a water quality engineer, I'm not so much of a kelp uh, expert. And so I spent a lot of time working with kelp experts in Norway uh, to understand the production cycle and the different types of work that they're doing there uh, to industrialize that technology in a lot of ways uh, so that we might be able to compete with other places uh, globally, say China, who may have lower labor uh, markets and other things that allow them to produce kelp inexpensively but also find different product streams for kelp uh, and different ways to process those uh, in an industrial way so that we may be able to revolutionize that in places like Norway, uh, the North Pole, well, the Northeast uh, US and uh, Canada. So uh, that's been the driver for this and, and I'll give you a little bit of background on that. So of course, um, that being the driver, I'm very interested in the nexus between food, water, and energy security uh, for our growing population. Uh, we have a significant challenge ahead of us over the next 50 years. Uh, our population is growing at an unprecedented rate and uh, historically not seen in the past. Uh, we're going to be reaching a point where we have to increase our energy production by 40%. Water uh, demand is increasing by about 30% and our food demand is gonna increase by about 40% by 2035. Uh, most of that is uh, due to the increasing population, modernization, urbanization, uh, poverty alleviation in a lot of places in the world, a very noble goal and something that we should be striving for. Uh, global climate change uh, plays a role uh, in these issues and of course coastal eutrophication. And so managing uh, a key to all of these uh, different aspects, okay, actually I'm going to show you how the nutrient cycle, okay, managing our nutrients is a very important uh, part of that overall process. And so uh, things that we can do to incorporate or to address each one of these three key areas in a single solution is critical to be able to, to have a sustainable solutions for the future. Okay, so just considering uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, about 15 million uh, metric tons of ammonia were produced by the Haber process. The Haber process is a, a very long-standing industrial process to produce ammonia. Uh, it produces ammonia from atmospheric nitrogen and in the process consumed in 1999 about 3% of U.S. natural gas uh, for that production. So it's very energy intense to produce that. Uh, most of that is uh, being produced for fertilizers to grow food for animals and uh, for people as well. Uh, globally, about 140 million metric tons of ammonium fertilizer are produced. Uh, about 99, more than 99% actually are produced by the Haber process. So very significant. Um, this supports bioenergy uh, feedstock, of course, growing corn. Uh, feed and food that sustains about 60% of our global populace. Uh, our population expansion in the last 150 years uh, can, in a lot of ways, be related to the, the production of ammonium through the Haber process, development of this uh, technology, as well as some other advancements. Uh, and you might be interested to know that about 80% of nitrogen in modern human tissues is likely to have originated from the Haber process. So it's a very significant part of our global food cycle as well. Okay. Uh, nutrient runoff though, related to terrestrial production of food feed and bioenergy feedstock, uh, obviously we listen to uh, uh, a presentation a minute ago on non-point sources of pollution, mostly focused around uh, urban pollution and MS forest, but also very significant to that is non-point source pollution coming from agricultural activities, terrestrial agriculture activities. Uh, in fact, uh, perhaps more significant uh, than uh, urban processes in terms of mass loading. Uh, of course, our ecosystems are further stressed by acidification uh, issues, increased temperature caused by greenhouse gases released in the atmosphere, and combustion of fossil fuels for energy and for that fertilizer nitrogen production, which contributes to the whole source. You can see how this uh, becomes part of the cycle. Uh, global use of nitrogen fertilizers by the Haber process is uh, increasing at a rate of about 15 million metric tons per year uh, in, in our response to trying to improve for food security globally. So this is a process and a problem that is getting greater and greater, and we need to find sustainable solutions to that. Okay, so uh, 
Aside from that, wastewater effluents, all right, what we do as people uh, and, go, and what goes to wastewater treatment plants are a major contributor to uh, nutrients into coastal water bodies, especially in places like here in Maine. Uh, and most biotechnologies that we're using at wastewater treatment plants are focused on the conversion of ammonium nitrogen, which is in the wastewater in, in significant quantities, into nitrogen gas, right, to get rid of it in some way and put it back into the atmosphere in a safe form. Um, obviously, uh, there's a, a, a critical cycle issue here where we're producing ammonium from nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, consuming a ton of energy to do that, putting that into our food cycles. We're consuming that food. It's becoming part of us. We're discarding that waste. And then when we send that to a wastewater treatment plant, we're putting that ammonium nitrogen right back into the atmosphere rather than trying to capture it directly and use it for fertilizer production. Okay. So it seems to be a little bit uh, counterproductive uh, thinking about that cycle. So uh, what, we're, what we're doing is looking at some other options for dealing with nutrients in wastewater outflows. What might we be able to do with that uh, in a productive way so that we can maybe break this, this cycle? So our uh, research goals are development of nutrient trading uh, with product, productive aquaculture as a viable approach to management of nitrogen, nitrogen cycle, uh, development of biomass feedstock that's not competing for land for food production, all right, uh, can be supplemented uh, with otherwise wasted nutrients from the wastewater industry, and uh, accelerate establishment of viable macroalgae aquaculture in the U.S., right, through technology development and greater integration across sectors. Specifically, in, in what I want to show you here today, is some of the work that we've been doing and looking at how this might work, okay, at a wastewater treatment plant. So we did some work to look at nutrient bioextractive potential of one particular species of kelp, uh, Saccharina latissima, which we chose because of a couple of reasons. One is that it's pretty well studied, so we know we have quite a bit of information about this kelp species. It's a high sugar content kelp, so there's a lot of energy potential in it, okay, uh, and uh, it's already grown. Here, where there's already technologies uh, that exist to grow this kelp. Uh, we wanted to determine production area requirements needed to meet nutrient bioextraction goals. Say, if we were going to offset nutrient bioextraction at wastewater treatment plants, how much production area might we need to be able to accomplish that goal? Uh, and we wanted to do something with that kelp that would be meaningful. Okay, and most people probably don't want to eat kelp that's been grown in a wastewater treatment plant outflow. Uh, but thankfully. Kelp has a lot of different end uses, and one of those is anaerobic digestion to produce biofuel. That biofuel can be burnt for energy, it can be used for heating purposes, it can also be converted uh, to electricity to power uh, pretty much anything we would like to power with that. And so we wanted to look at the anaerobic digestion potential to see uh, how that might work, and also to determine how that might be affected by salinity if that were to be carried over into the digesters, because it is a bioprocess Salt can affect the microbes that work on that process. So we did some kelp cultivation trials with the help of some industry partners. Ocean Approved uh, was doing some work around Booth Bay Harbor and, uh, and did some cultivation trials so that we could understand production rates in the area that would be meaningful. Uh, also the Booth Bay Harbor Sanitary District and Chris Higgins uh, working there uh, did some work for us to cultivate kelp uh, right there near his outfalls uh, and to provide us that kelp so that we could characterize it and look at the biogas potential from it. Uh, we went there and collected some of that kelp in May of 2014. Uh, say we shipped it overnight, we actually drove it back. I uh, kind of like what I'm doing. Uh, I don't mind the drive, it's actually a pretty dry. Uh, and, and then we of course uh, characterized it. And so uh, what we have up here is kind of our, uh, you know, our own characterization and from Ocean Approved, uh, they put, gave us an estimate. They, they believe that they're able to produce about 45 tons fresh weight per hectare per year, right? And when we, we looked at the dry uh, biomass associated with that, the dry weight, we got about uh, 4.6 tons per dry weight of uh, dry weight per hectare per year. Uh, just to give you a, a context with that, here's some other numbers from different studies, uh, you know, in Spain, Sweden, and Norway, uh, where they've been producing the same kelp. Uh, so you can get a, uh, an idea of how we compare. So some of their fresh weight numbers are a little bit less. Uh, the folks that I work with in Norway, uh, Sinta Fisheries and Aquaculture uh, Research Group, 
Uh, they believe they're able to get up to maybe even 75. They're working with a, a large number of industries there actually uh, to try to get to numbers like this. Uh, in terms of dry biomass content, we're closer uh, to these other uh, numbers. I'm not sure why our dry biomass was a little bit more. I think it might have been the way we process that uh, versus the way that they're typically processed. It's a little bit different than what you would normally do in wastewater industry. So I think that might have been the driver there. So um, importantly, the, the dry biomass is uh, the one that we work with anyway, because uh, that's where all the, the numbers are for nutrients. The rest of it's water. So we don't worry about that too much. So we're actually right on the order of, of what other people are finding. Uh, characterizing that biomass, uh, we can see a few things. There's quite a bit of chemical oxygen demand uh, in the material, meaning organic content that we might be able to use. Volatile solids are, are pretty reasonable. Uh, we did some biomethane potential tests. We got about 180 milliliters of biogas per gram of volatile solids at a salinity of two parts per trillion, and, and that reduced a little bit at 17 parts per trillion. I know this all doesn't mean a whole lot. There's a lot of stuff up here, a lot of numbers, uh, but we really just wanted to understand, like, the characteristics of this and how this might look if we were to take the waste material at the end of the digestion process and use it as a productive fertilizer to offset nitrogen as well. Okay, so uh, biogas production and nitrogen production. Um, importantly, uh, what we got from this, all these numbers allowed us to do some calculation. Um, we get about 88 kilograms per hectare uh, per year of nitrogen removal, right, based on that 45 times brush weight per hectare per year number at 10.2% dry matter. Okay, so that, um, that may not mean a lot at the off offset, but what that really means is that for every million gallons per day of wastewater treatment plant flow rate, for every milligram per liter that we're trying to remove of nitrogen from that flow rate, we need about 16 hectares of kelp farm to do it. All right, so we're able to, to kind of put up a number. All right. Uh, so we took that number, said, all right, so what is it that we're trying to do at wastewater treatment plants? What do we want to remove? Uh, the Water Environment Federation has put together some different nutrient target goals. US EPA is pushing pretty strongly nutrient effluent requirements for wastewater treatment plants. And some of these wastewater treatment plants, like the one in Booth Bay Harbor, are space limited, or for other reasons, it'll be a very expensive prospect for them to uh, put in systems to handle nutrient uh, removal. And so uh, looking down this list, we can see kind of some of these different goals and how that might fit in the context of their treatment plants. So for total nitrogen, by the way, we can remove phosphorus with uh, kelp as well as part of the plant tissue. So we can also do that. So I put that up there. But in terms of nitrogen, uh, level one, level two, and level three treatment would be from eight milligrams per liter to three into one uh, for wastewater treatment plant outflows, for instance, for nitrogen. All right, so then we did some modeling. Uh, it's kind of now it's getting into the fun stuff for me because it's all wastewater stuff and we get to model things and see how it works uh, to understand, uh, you know, just to give ourselves a, a conceptual system uh, for a typical wastewater treatment plant, secondary treatment. So uh, anywhere USA, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, some of the input parameters slighted more towards uh, temperatures and things that we would see here in Maine. Uh, and we can see the effluent, we might get something about 9.6 milligrams per liter nitrogen. All right, so using that, we put together uh, this plot to say, all right, if we have wastewater treatment plants of varying flow rates, okay, from one to 100 million gallons per day, uh, and on this, this axis, we can plot then the aquaculture production uh, area required to meet those level one goals. All right, so from 9.6 down to eight, and so the way you would read this is, say you had 9.6 milligrams per liter in your effluent, your target nitrogen was eight, right? Your treatment plant flow rate was two milligram, uh, million gallons per day, then you can read up and you would need about a 50 uh, hectare kelp farm. To put that in context for you, all right, some of the larger farms, I'm not sure what I just did, but I did something. Some of the larger farms in Norway, uh, are running at about six to eight hectares now, but their permits are up to 60. Okay, so they're, they're, and, they're and, and the projections that they're making, they've been pretty on at Sintef, is that probably in the next 10 to 15 years, they're gonna be farming 50 or 60 hectare farms. So we're in the ballpark now, right, to, re, to meet level one nutrient effluent goals. Of course, level two and level three, a little bit more stringent uh, and would require larger, uh, larger uh, kelp farm sizes, okay? Uh, and so this gives you a context for there. 
So if you're, if you're looking for something like level two or level three treatment, all right, then perhaps this isn't the only answer for you. But it doesn't mean that it can't be part of the answer for you, right? You may say you have to meet level three nutrient effluent goals. You may design something in your treatment plan to do the easy part, the less energy intense part of getting you to level two, okay? Every extra one, every extra milligram per liter of nitrogen you remove after that takes a lot of energy to remove, right? It's a lot of diminishing returns. Then you may use, say, a kelp farm to polish the rest of the effluent up to level three treatment goals, all right? So it may be a, an idea uh, to kind of help meet some of those gaps that you have uh, and, and can kind of help with the cost. All right, so uh, we can do that again, you know, with phosphorus as well, so you can kind of see that. So this is a, that concept. If you were to meet level two goals, and then wanted to go to level three, for instance, now you can see we're back on the order of wastewater treatment plant sizes that are working again. Okay, so uh, <laughs> a concept that might work. All right, so with that, uh, I want to look at biomethane potential really quick. Uh, so uh, we did in our study, I mentioned before, we had had uh, an average biomethane potential of 180 milliliters per gram volatile solids. We're actually on the low side with ours. Uh, I think it's because we used a wastewater treatment plant, anaerobic digester sludge, rather than a sludge that was uh, already, uh, uh, already um, used to uh, taking kelp as its substrate. Okay, so there's some things in there like the salinity, the type of material, the bacteria that are in there are just not used to that as a food. Right, and I think that we'll jack those numbers up. Indeed, um, looking at numbers from other people for saccharine latissima, we're on the low side. Uh, this, these folks here, oddly enough, uh, they did an interesting set, study, and then they said, well, to be, they were doing some economic analysis on biogas potential, and they said to be conservative, we'll use this number. We'll use this number, which actually just matched ours perfectly. So that was great for me because we're kind of like in that. We can see where they're at. Um, where these things match up economically. But anyway, um, some reasonable biogas potential. Um, and you can see how particle sizes, uh, obviously if you grind this stuff up, it kind of helps with the biodigestion. And of course, increasing salinity, uh, you know, you get decreasing uh, biogas production. However, uh, even without any special treatment, we're still generally up in this range. Uh, we didn't find that to be too much of a problem. And what you could do is set the kelp out to just in the rain for a little while and rinse some of that, capture some of the salt coming off of that, uh, and then digest your material. Uh, so lots of science stuff. I'm gonna skip through lots of science stuff. Uh, and so you can see kind of full-scale um, treatment plant uh, simulations now, so we put this in. Uh, I would propose that in a situation where you're going to digest kelp for bioenergy, you wouldn't do that at a treatment plant uh, for some specific reasons of actually some of those nutrients are going to end up coming back out of the treatment plant, so you don't want to do that. Uh, you would rather capture those. Also, the material, the quality of the material that you get that you might want to use as a fertilizer later will be much higher if it's not digested with wastewater, with human wastewater. So perhaps you want to digest that and the new emerging kind of food waste digesters that are popping up, right? So this would be a nice uh, addition to something like that and could supplement those. All right, and so uh, just to give you an example, 26 million gallon per day treatment plant with a 20 day typical HRT for an anaerobic digester uh, might end up with 70,000 kilowatt hours per day per, uh, uh, of energy production. So actually pretty significant energy production you can get. Um, because this has a high energy value in relation to wastewater treatment plant residuals. All right, so all this wrapping all this up, uh, you know, we were looking at saccharine latissima for nutrient bioextraction and recovery. Uh, we could grow 45 tons fresh weight per hectare. Uh, that would allow us to remove 88 kilograms nitrogen per year. Uh, and we could calculate uh, farm sizes needed. Uh, and uh, of course, could do some, some good work with methane potential. So what are we doing with this in the future? Uh, we're continuing to explore this. We're looking at how wastewater uh, effluents affect the quality of the kelp in particular so that we might be able to understand other types of uses for this kelp material. This is one of several that you might use it for. And quite frankly, uh, methane production is a low value uh, product from kelp. All right, so there's other things that you could do 
that have more value and perhaps could be more valuable for you. Uh, from a wastewater treatment plant standpoint, however, if you're using this as an alternative for nutrients, then that allows a wastewater treatment plant to supplement the enterprise, right? So somebody who is working on uh, doing kelp farming, for instance, might be able, if the legislative structure, if the regulatory <laughs> structure were in place, might be able to apply for nutrient trading credits, right, and supplement that activity. Uh, and so that would be a, a really uh, positive thing to come out of something like this. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, economic aspects of this, there's a recent study that came out of Sweden. We're, we're looking at this also in context, but just to give you a, an early idea of how this kind of plays out, uh, they looked at half hectare, half hectare and 10 hectare farm sizes and uh, using just energy content in anaerobic digestion and said, all right, does this meet European standards for green energy production, right? At 10 hectares, they were very, very close, actually. And that didn't include things like nutrient remediation from wastewater treatment plants being included in that calculation, all right? So all those offsets. So I think that as we apply some of these things into there, we're also going to meet green energy production goals, at least for Europe, which are, I think, a little bit more stringent even than the U.S. And so uh, we're, we're looking at a concept, I think, that has a lot of uh, potential. And with that, I'll just throw up some acknowledgments to some graduate students. Uh, Chris Higgins, of course, at Booth Bay Harbor, Paul Dobbins at Ocean Improved, and I've mentioned Synthet Fisheries and Aquaculture in Norway also for uh, some of the work that I did there. I have time for questions, if you do. Yeah. Just one question, yeah, and we'll, we'll get your talk up. Okay, sorry. I was trying to do the calculation in my head, but I couldn't remember the numbers for it. If you were to take the typical uh, discharge permit for sewage treatment plants in town um, and normalize it to the number of inhabitants, it seems to me that the area of kelp that you extract that comes out of the plant is something on the same order of magnitude as the area of the town itself. Yeah, it probably would be. I haven't thought of it that way, but I suppose it probably would be. Maybe, maybe a little smaller, but yeah. Something on that. Yeah. So that's going to be for policy. Oh, yeah, because of course. Yeah, I mean, any kind of aquaculture, I think, is going to have something. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So a treatment plant being extreme, obviously. Have you got any back curiosity uh, on the second line? It's one of the things that we're interested in in terms of the quality of these. Uh, but since we're not looking at it for food, uh, it has been something we focus on. Um, we're, we're a little behind, Richard. So are you staying for lunch? I'll be here for lunch. Okay. Can you ask your question? Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yes, thank you for inviting me. I know I'm the last thing in between us and lunch, so I will try to be expedient, but I think I have some really um, interesting data to show, and it's all also about how kelp can help. This is a statement that one of my undergraduate students really likes to use. Um, but before I get into that, I do want to mention our new Center for Venture Research on Seafood Security. The purpose of the center is to really go out and find out what the needs are of industry members, policymakers, and the general public alike. Match that with the state-of-the-art science that's happening at Bigelow, but also at our partnering institutions, and find support for that through non-traditional means of funding, um, such as philanthropic interests or, in some cases, foundational support, especially in the light of our new government, this may be <laughs> more important to, to find these other sources of funding as we move forward. The purpose of the center is really to translate this cut, cutting edge science for positive outcomes, especially in the Gulf of Maine where aquaculture is a potential for a new, um, the development, further development of the economy in the Gulf of Maine. We need to find ways to enhance its sustainability and the future uh, um, threats of warming that are happening here in the Gulf of Maine faster than just about anywhere else. 
and due to ocean acidification. Now this is just trying to drive home some of the points that Damien was making earlier this morning that the coast of Maine is particularly prone to ocean, uh, coastal acidification processes in addition to ocean acidification processes. It's not only the nutrient loading that's coming from that stormwater runoff, it's the fresh water itself is actually lower in acidity than salt water. So we just have a lot of reasons why the buffering capacity from the Gulf of Maine is lower than elsewhere. So it's a problem for us. And I wanna remind you briefly why it's a problem and walk through just one example of mussels, which is a building industry in Maine. We're at an 85% trade deficit for uh, mussel aquaculture in the US. Most of the mussels we eat come from Canada, but there's a huge opportunity to develop this aquaculture industry in Maine. But when larval mussels are subjected to higher acidity, they develop abnormally, have a higher mortality rate, and a slower growth rate. Not only that, but they are more susceptible potentially to infections from disease. These are um, some newer bits of information that are coming out about the interaction between ocean acidification and disease. Finally, for mussels, it's not only the shell that gets affected, but the beards, the byssus thread that holds on to the ropes on which mussels are grown can become weakened under higher acidity, and they can actually start to fall off the the lines or even off of natural substrates. Um, and the interaction between increased storm activity and weaker business threads could lead to mussels um, disappearing from the shoreline. And in fact, we, there is anecdotal evidence that this is the case here in Maine. Um, I'm going to skip the example of the soft shell clams in the interest of time, but they are also similarly declining in Maine there are several potential reasons acidity could be one of them, rising acidity in the muds. Let's put this into context. Here we are today at about 400 microatmospheres of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That corresponds to just over eight seawater pH and aragonite saturation state of around two. And this is the direction we're headed to um, over 800 and near to 1,000 microatmospheres of carbon dioxide in the ocean seawater, corresponding to an aragonite saturation state level just above one and a pH around 7.75. This maps out where we can expect to see chronic effects on shellfish and we're headed towards an area where we expect to see acute effects on shellfish, causing declines in populations. What can we do about it? Well, it was mentioned earlier that we know that deforestation is um, part of the reason we have so much excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So one movement is to reforest or plant trees. We can do the same thing in the ocean, which Shane introduced very nicely, and that's by farming kelp. Maine is actually the first state to have a commercial kelp farm in America, and that was Ocean Approved Farm, and they were founded in 2009 in Casco Bay. And they farm the sugar kelp, which is an edible variety. Um, Seaweed harvest is a long time tradition in Maine, stemming back to the 1800s and likely much before that um, due to the Native American culture practices as well. So the idea of phytoremediation is not only um, about nutrient absorption, but can also be directly about the carbon, di absor di oh, sorry, carbon dioxide absorption due to photosynthesis. And the idea that Susie and I and others have been bantering about for a while is that around a sugar kelp farm, you might expect to find this halo of seawater that has um, lower acidity or a higher pH level. It also has a higher oxygen content and a lower nitrogen content. And what does that mean if you're farming in an integrated multi-trophic aquaculture setting where you have mussels and kelps grown, kelp grown together? Or on an oyster farm, um, in the Damar Scotta River, the more uh, likely pairing would be rockweed and oysters that grow in a similar area. And then where softshell clams are grown, the likely pairing is eelgrass, which isn't edible per se, but it's also a, a, um, a source of CO2 absorption or that phytoremediation in that system. So the first thing that we set out to do was ask, among these particular characters, the rockweeds, the eelgrasses, the sugar kelp, which are the most uh, potential, which candidates have the most potential for the phytoremediation purpose of absorbing carbon dioxide? And we did an experiment using those PCO2 levels that we see now 
in the future and even historically in the past. And discovered that kelp behavior is dynamic. The more CO2 you give it, the more CO2 it absorbs. So not only can it absorb CO2 now, but it may be an even um, more active form of phytoremediation moving into the future. This was true for all of the species studies, sugar kelp, the ovalactuca, this is fucus vesiculosis, and the eelgrass, although sugar kelp had the strongest impact. The consequence of that is that here's today, if you um, have a, a small body of water which the sugar kelp is pulling CO2 out of, it raises that aragonite saturation state by about a unit. And then in the future, it can raise saturation state by almost two units. This is in a laboratory setting, in a small mesocosm. The other species are also able to raise this uh, aragonite saturation state, but their capacity to do so is diminished to some degree at higher CO2 levels. The next question is, well, we can measure this in a jar in a lab. What does that mean? for a field setting. So we went out to the Ocean Approved Farm in Casco Bay between Shabig and Little Shabig. There's Paul Dobbins. And um, it's located right about here. This is an experimental plan for the future, but at this stage, we've only been able to deploy the monitoring equipment here and here, and that's about 250 meters apart. So we have a set of CO2 and pH sensors inside the farm, and then outside the farm, uh, up current, based on tidally driven flow in Casco Bay from where the farm is. So this is our control outside the farm and our inside the farm measurement. And we set out um, sensors that are measuring pH, oxygen, PCO2, and took a variety of other metrics. This is Susie and my technician, um, Brittany, who are out there collecting discrete samples, monitoring and downloading data from the instruments, and measuring kelp growth simultaneously. And what we found is that farm sugar kelp has the potential, indeed, to raise seawater pH and aragonite saturation state within a kelp farm. So the green dots are inside the kelp farm and the black dots are outside. And that red line is the threshold that I mentioned earlier, below which shellfish are expected to experience acute effects of ocean acidification. So we found evidence that aragonite saturation state can be raised by as much as 0.3 units within a farm relative to outside of the farm today. That's not waiting for a future situation, that's right now. And the impact or the magnitude of that effect scales with the size of the kelp. So when it's really small, there's a little difference. But as the kelp gets bigger, the impact of phytoremediation also grows. What we are discovering though is that as Damien mentioned earlier, it's all about the balance between productivity, primary productivity, and respiration. There is a turning point. Once the kelp gets really large, it slows down its growth rate, and it starts to become biofouled with other organisms. That community turns from net productivity to net respiration. So a critical aspect to the success of phytoremediation is the actual removal of the kelp from that system. This is not a solution to ocean acidification. This is a solution to coastal acidification in a small zone. And it's not a permanent solution because as you eat that kelp, you exhale and that CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. But it fixes the problem for a small space in time where you might be growing shellfish of interest. What does this mean for the mussels? I'm gonna show you a series of graphs now. Um, on, on the columns here is some different measurements of muscle health. The first one is the proportion of muscles that develop normally. This is the size of muscles, and this is mortality rate of muscles. And these are very recent publications. The black bars represent what we see today for saturation state or pH, and what that means for muscle growth today. And then, if you look at the green bars, that's what happens inside a kelp farm relative to outside the kelp farm. There's potential for muscles to develop, 7% of them to develop more normally, for them to be 13% larger when grown with kelp, and for 4% more to survive. These numbers are small numbers, but enough to potentially impact um, aquaculture industry now. What's really compelling is when you start to think about the future and the fact that kelp scales up its primary production rate to meet the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the environment, they're actually CO2 limited. 
And you see that the impact of being in or near a farm could mean that muscles could develop 30%, 37% more normally. They could be 48% larger and 30% more could survive relative to outside the halo of phytoremediation. So while this could be an important impact now, the significance of phytoremediation may only gain further momentum in the future. That doesn't mean that it's a rubber stamp sealed um, option though, because in fact, the ability for sugar kelp to absorb carbon dioxide, in this case, a negative bar is a good thing, is um, invalidated or affected by warming. And that's for our local sugar kelp populations that are adapted to colder climates. However, Bigelow Laboratories is hoping and helping to create lines of sugar kelp seed that may um, be a source of material for us to look at adaptation to warming in the future and find example lines, maybe from further southern populations, that would continue to serve this phytoremediation purpose even in warmer waters. I want to talk really quickly about the eelgrass work we've been doing also. This is in Casco Bay, and many of you may be aware that in green here is the eelgrass cover in 2013, and in red is where eelgrass once was in the earlier part of the turn of the century, but is no longer. So we've lost about 50% of our eelgrass cover in the past couple of decades. And what that means for the ecosystem services that eelgrass provides to Casco Bay is a little alarming. We also measured oxygen and pH inside an eelgrass, in, inside a cove covered with eelgrass and inside a cove that is now depopulative eelgrass. These coves have very similar hydrodynamic properties, so they're comparable, and found that when you have eelgrass cover, you have a higher pH overall and certainly a higher oxygen content during the months of peak primary production for eelgrass. We've been working with friends of Casco Bay who took at the same time sediment measurements of pH, that's where the soft shell clams are actually growing, um, concurrent with our um, water body measurements of pH. And during this period, the August period, when eelgrass is at its peak primary production, it does seem like there's suggestion that sediment pH is also higher, along with how the water body pH is higher. Although it's very hard to capture the spatial variability in sediment pH, and there's a significant larger amount of sampling that needs to be made to make any definitive statements here. And then that effect becomes lost as the peak prim primary productive period of eelgrass moves along. So what are the implications of phytoremediation as an adaptation strategy? The seaweed photosynthesis could be enough to buffer against acidification in a very small space and over a certain defined period of time. And then integrated motilitrophic aquaculture could increase shellfish growth rate today and maybe even more so in the future to reduce that time to market size for mussels, which can be up to five years for a mussel farm. And that can be a major barrier to entry into the aquaculture industry, given how much you need to invest in capital to set up the infrastructure before you expect return on that investment. Oop, sorry. Kelp farming can mitigate eutrophication or nutrient loading and hypoxia and acidification simultaneously. So it's a many pronged sword to a problem. It also happens to generate revenue while you're doing that and creates a very nutritional food source. So it's quite a compelling um, uh, approach. The future directions are to further quantify the magnitude and size of the halo around the ocean approved farm. And then if we can procure more funding to do it at other farm locations and see how consistent that halo creation is. It's, it's got to be contextual in some degree based on circulation patterns and uh, existing conditions at any site. And we wanna get a handle on what that kind of variability is. And we wanna know, like some of the calculations that um, were just shown, that Shane showed, how much biomass of kelp do you need to have the given impact that you're looking for to help with planning for size and distribution of farms. We also need to understand that critical importance of harvest timing of the harvest before you turn to net respiration from net primary production and hope that that phytoremediation purpose matches up with the production needs of the farm. Are you harvesting too early for what they would like to use the sugar kelp for too late? You need to make sure those things match. 
And then finally, we need to look into the wild harvested species and their ability to remove dissolved inorganic carbon from the system. Rockweed harvest is a, um, a big part of the main seaweed industry. What we don't know yet is how removing rockweed can help with the CO2 absorption problem. There is reason to believe that when you trim rockweed from harvesting, it grows back denser and faster than it would if you left it alone. So there's the potential for harvest to stimulate further CO2 absorption. We don't know the answer to this question yet, but it's something that I'm interested in finding out. Basically, we are really hoping to put the science we do to work to be useful for policymakers, industry members, and to generally educate the public. And with that, I'd like, I have a lot of people to thank, most notably Susie, for her work on the project as well. Thank you. As an oyster farmer, obviously I'm intensely interested in this. Uh, here's the part of it that I can't get past is that the, the times when these shellfish are growing the fastest, yeah. and respiring the most, and using up the most oxygen is during the warm part of the growing season. Yeah. So, you know, what's, what's the answer to that? It's a great question. So, the match is a little bit better for sugar kelp and mussels because they're growing year round. And they can kind of go dormant in the winter, but this could bring them out of their dormancy stage. But, but don't muscles grow faster in the summer? They do, but to, to boost their growth rate at any point in the cycle, right. it can't be harmful. Um, the sugar kelp growing season is from now, November. Ocean Approved just got their lines on, out on the farm through to May or June. But people have been fiddling around with it and have discovered you can put lines in much earlier as early as September, you can put lines in as late as January. Figuring out how to do successional planting so that you have the year-round impact of sugar kelp farming or other seaweed species farming is a whole new area that we need to start looking into. That could help um, growing shelf, could better match the shellfish peak growth period. So a follow-up question is one of the things that is being done in other states in a very organized way is shell recycling. Yeah. Uh, not just for oysters, but for, uh, <clears throat> I think there's a potential for doing that here. And yeah. you had mentioned, you know, a student who's interested in looking yeah. at using calcium carbonate shells to yep. grinding it up and using that. Yeah. Um, is, is, are you the only person working on that? No. Is anybody here know? Mark Green is who to speak to about that okay. at St. Joseph's College. Oh, I know he's done a class. He's been doing yeah. that in three-dimensional system? I don't know, but he is one of the only ones working around here doing that. Um, I would say that also there's a fellow named George Waldwasser over at um, Oregon State, and he is a pretty good expert on this stuff too, and I would love to have him come speak so, to us. So well. speaking of George, uh, yeah. I was just at the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers uh, Conference, and there is kind of a raging controversy about the importance of omega versus, uh, versus metabolic depression. And, and I, I don't expect anybody to answer you know, that question. From my perspective, it doesn't really matter because the effect is the same, whether, whether it's larvae or post-set juvenile. My question is, how does anybody here think that may affect uh, the efficacy of macroalgae? And you know, in other words, it's really the connection between IPCO2 and omega versus just, you know, um, to answer briefly, we are interested in measuring the effects actually on muscle growth and hope next year to do outplants at um, increasing distances from the sugar kelp farm to not guess what the impact is on muscles or shellfish, but to discover that. There's another metabolic effect that no one's talking about except for maybe some folks at UNE, and that's the detritus coming off of the kelp itself can be another food source for the shellfish. So there's yet another way that it can help mitigate the situation. I would back up a second and talk about the crushed shells idea. So this is essentially <laughs> antacid for the ocean, giving the ocean tons. It can- It's also putting, putting stuff that has been growing the ocean back in. Putting it back in, that's true. Um, it can work, 
Without proper treatment of the shells, there is the potential for distributing disease amongst populations. Um, it is costly to do without necessarily generating revenue unless you get an immediate return on the shellfish growth itself. So that's why I've leaned towards phytoremediation, but it doesn't mean that it's not also a viable process if done right and should be pursued as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. I just, just want to follow up on Bill's comment. Is, um, I mean, it's a concern about conservation of forestry, and we have an education outreach staffers here at recess. Um, that was one thing on the question of more volunteer activities with volunteers. So we are doing one of all the arts who works in Virginia has really mobilized this their program is, is related to reef restoration as well. So I just wanted to mention and also we met with um, Dutch Forest Future this year. I know for our organizations and just thinking about this as well. So just to fill in that show you that. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, Nicole. Um, actually, I think I asked Susan this question back at the, the June meeting, but I'm going to ask you because um, clearly your thinking has been evolving about the, the yeah. role of these different uh, macro algae. Um, you know, back in the 1990s, we probably had the biggest uncontrolled um, phytoremediation uh, experiment on the coast that was sea urchin harvesting. Mm -hmm. that, uh, Depleted the the um, the urchin fishery uh, on a coastwide basis, and I'm just wondering now we have some of these CO2 uptake rates for different species. Mm -hmm. Whether you might do some back the envelope calculations to to what the impact may have been. That's a great idea. Um, a while back, Joe Salisbury and I were putting together some ideas, and we did a back envelope calculation for how much, for what's grown at Ocean Approved, can you expect, uh, how much CO2 can you expect to be removed and how much organic saturation state can you expect to drop? And surprisingly, those numbers match what we are measuring in the farm. I mean, match, I mean, they're not an order of magnitude off. They're within the same ballpark. So I, at first I was very wary of doing those kinds of calculations, but I think it's worth trying. Yeah, Julia. Uh, so, my question is um, so if we're talking about sort of the timing of when the health is growing um, versus when the muscles, you know, the females are going to be settling. Mm -hmm. Is there an overlap there? Because, I mean, if they're sort of most vulnerable at that stage, is there sort of potential that the federal radiation could be settling? Yeah. <laughs> muscles aren't settling for a while versus when they're sort of growing. More so for mussels, yeah, the timing is close to, more closely aligned with their vulnerable stage. It's a really good point, good question. Yeah, John. Yeah, I think you uh, mentioned potentially upon the sea one with the Um Right now, just so you're aware, um, any uh, seaweed farming, second round of seaweed has not come from the Gulf of Maine. Yes, yes. And the last year, just recently, we took our own able farming that really stopped Uh -huh. talk a lot about genetics yeah. which is, is really new to market. Yeah, it is an important point. It's why I also like to talk about Saccharina latissima, because it is native to this area, but it's present on both coasts, so it's less nerve-wracking. My original training was on coral reefs, and there's nothing more that you worry about on coral reefs than an outbreak of macroalgae. So I'm extremely sensitive to the nature of invasive seaweeds, and how they can really ruin an ecosystem. <coughs> David. That was a great talk. Thanks. <laughs> um, I was wondering if the, the farms themselves ever self limit. So, on a muscle farm, you know, without any biological activity in the uptake, that type of thing, do you see a signature that the farms themselves can drive the pH low enough that the density begins to matter? And if not, and why would it ever need to be remediated anyway? That's a good question, and it would be informative to put out these sensors within the muscle farm to see if the opposite is happening. In effect, David's saying, instead of creating a halo in a 
kelp farm, does a mussel farm create a vacuum of building blocks for their carbonate saturation? I would guess that that doesn't happen often only because one of the requirements for a mussel farm is there for, for there to be at least a five centimeter per second flow so that there's delivery of food to those mussels. And that may or may not wash out that, that um, kind of boundary layer that can build up, but I don't know. And we should put these instruments in farms, in shellfish farms as well, to see if that does happen. Yeah. And if you're concerned about what the effective rate of flow is in that activity, uh, is there any look at when in the life cycle of the kelp that you're it should be within the center versus on fringes of the I, all these questions are so critical, and that's why we're working with Joe to start to, if we can get the funding together, to do this mapping of the CO2 signature around the farm and even through it if possible, because we don't know that fine scale distribution of CO2 within and at the edges of the farm. And trying to figure 